Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Today's program has been brought to you by greatbrewers.com, a social media marketing platform dedicated to promoting the world's great brewers and the beers they create. For more information, visit greatbrewers.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. Hey, welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. This is Jimmy Carboni from Jimmy's Number 43 and the Good Beer Seal. And we've got a special show for you tonight. It's uh, April 16, 2013. It's Shiner Beer from Texas, Hot Sauce and Pretzels. i got uh, Eric Weber. from uh, He's the PR guy for uh, Shiner, uh, which has just come to New York City. And it's kind of a big deal for people from Texas. And, and Lena from uh, Zygmunt's Pretzels. Who's hey. the, all right, so we got some pretzels, we got some hot sauces, and we got Shiner. So Shiner, that's a big story. Though. A, lot, a lot of friends who went to UT in Texas, they always ask them, can they get Shiner? There are uh, thousands of former Texans here in the New York area. And then uh, I, untold numbers more people who've been through Texas, who've, uh, who've had a chance to sample Shiner. And so it was inevitable that we'd get here. It took us 104 years, but we're finally here as of this week. All right. Well, that's cool. And Lena, you, yeah. you're from uh, Sigmund's Pretzels. You, 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 you've been to a lot of beer events with us, and uh, right. you've got a new pretzel that you wanted us to try. Yeah, I brought a sourdough. We just started working with this uh, very temperamental as all sourdoughs because you don't use real yeast. All right. So you sit around and you hope that whatever yeast pores are in the air will end up in your dough and uh, it will rise. So, yeah, they are a little bit more acidic and uh, like softer crumb and probably. Uh, a good bed- backdrop for anything with strong flavors. All right. And we're going to have yeah. a couple call-ins later in the show, too. So here we go. Give a little uh, cheers to the people in Boston. You know, that was a little unexpected yes. tragedy yesterday. And, cheers. Uh, Pros it. You know, we, life goes on, but sorry. It's pretty tragic. Um, but we're here with, with Shiner. So you guys are pretty awesome. You started out your Bavarian <laughs> Influence Brewery, 1909 in Texas. Right. Uh, the, the town of Shiner, it's population 2069 in central Texas, and it was settled by... German and Czech immigrants, and they were farmers uh, for the most part. And not long after they settled that, they began to brew their own beer because they couldn't find beer that that they remembered from their home countries. And so they started the Shiner Brewing Association, which was a an amateur operation for the first few years. And then they they got good enough that they uh, they called in a professional, and they found a guy, Cosmo Spetzel, uh, who was Bavarian raised and trained as a brewmaster and he found his way to Shiner by way of South Africa and Cairo and Canada and somehow they found him and convinced him to come to really the middle of nowhere in Texas to to be their brewmaster. And he eventually bought the brewery, uh, gave it his name, so it's the Spetzel Brewery in Shiner, Texas and then Shiner Beers are the name of the beers. But uh, So we've been uh, brewing beers mostly with German and Czech influence uh, for 104 years now. Well, we've got a bunch of merchandise for you guys. It seems like you've got pretty <laughs> awesome T-shirts and hats. Uh, if, if we're going to tweet on a, at beer underscore sessions, uh, whoever retweets retweets it first is going to win a free T-shirt from Shiner. Uh, he, yeah, it, it's quite an amazing thing that you guys have have got this image in Texas and and people are really loyal to you. And in the days of these new craft breweries, it's always about what's new and and, and you know what's culty. 
But uh, how, how do you guys, what do you attribute your success to and your popularity to? I think part of it is is that there is a, a an authenticity to the brand. I mean, it is uh, we're brewing over half a million barrels a year now, but every drop of it is still brewed right there in Shiner, Texas, uh, by 120 brewery workers. Um, the brewmaster Jimmy Morick has worked at the brewery since he was 16 years old. He walks to work. He's it's a there's a small townishness. The brewery is very much a part of the town, and vice versa. And I think that's an important thing, is an authenticity thing. Um, and, and then the beer really caught on in Austin in the 70s. The brewery was about to go under. Uh, in fact, one of many times it was about to go under. And uh, it caught on in Austin. There's a real eclectic mix of people in Austin, rednecks, hippies, college students, musicians. And uh, I think they embraced the authenticity in that sort of small-town nature. And, uh, and so it's really taken off from there. So Austin is really our spiritual home, even though uh, Shiner's 90 miles away. And, uh, and so from there, it just it grew out from there. It's a, a devoted following to a, kind of a Texas icon, even though we're – I don't like to think of us so much as a Texas beer as, as it's a small-town brewery. I think the brewery would be the same success story if it were in Iowa or Ohio or somewhere else. But we happen to be in Texas, and we have legions of people who grew up in Texas and left and who have – Asked for the beer and we followed them. So, um, what 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 was the beer scene like in Texas, like in the seventies? Uh, Lone Star, and um, yeah, Lone Star. I knew That's that right. uh, there was a, a Belgian guy, Pierre Sellis. That he came along he a little bit later. To, he late, went to Texas, yeah, late seventies, and uh, and he came along and. He was a, a, a real pioneer in the craft business. That long before that term was, was used, at least very commonly, uh, he was there. And again, he was, uh, that was an extremely popular beer in Austin. And I think is, there are a number of now craft breweries in and around Austin. And I think he really is, is, ought to be credited, if not credited, as, as the pioneer of Texas craft brewing, if not broader than that. Uh, but then you know, he sold the, sold the brand to, uh, to, to Miller and it, it got shelved, unfortunately, and then they never really did anything with it. And so it just it sort of disappeared. It's made a kind of minor revival lately, but um, yeah. But he was definitely a pioneer and, and was an influence. You know, hardly anybody was drinking Belgian beers, uh, certainly in Texas back then. Uh, but he was quite popular then. Yeah, I remember when I first started drinking beer that Celis White Ale was, yeah. was one that one of the few Americans that people were really proud of. Back then, yeah, and it was uh, you know it's a, it's a shame that that he's probably not still around doing that. Uh, but uh, I don't I don't know what's happened to the brand. I know it's I think it's been bought and sold a time or two, but not produced. Well, let's try some beers. What did you bring with us? I've never had a Shiner. I've only been to Texas once. I drove through Amarillo a <laughs> yeah. long time ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Amarillo. That's uh, yeah. That's and my my buddy uh, a long way. My from buddy's Austin the editor at Thrillist. Uh, his name's David uh, Blend. Oh and yeah, he's yeah, always yeah. you know him. He's always asking for yeah. for Shiner, and he's a big UT yeah. guy. So uh, well, the um, the flagship beer at, at Shiner is uh, is Shiner Bach, and it it makes up probably about seventy five percent of our our production. Uh, the thing, the interesting thing I think about Shiner Bach is it's not really a true Bach beer. Real beer connoisseurs sometimes uh, 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 push back a little bit on it, saying it's not a true Bach, and and it's not really. Um, it's uh, it was called Bach since 1913, and they called it that mostly because they brewed it seasonally in the spring, about the time Bach did, and it was a dark beer, and that's not the one I opened, but uh, we're going to try right. something different. Um, and the the reason that became our flagship was that uh, it's it's dark and a little more full-bodied without being... Uh, uh, too heavy. It's a very sessionable beer, and so people liked it because it was... Somewhat exotic before people were, were getting too experimental with beer, uh, but it was a departure from uh, the Shiner Premium or the um, uh, Lone Stars or anything else. The one you're sampling right now is, uh, is Shiner Cosmos. It's, uh, it's pretty rare. It's only available in what we call our family reunion, our variety pack, and so it's, uh, it's really highly sought after, but we, we, we don't brew it regularly. We, it's, it's, it's a little bit hard to find, and we like it that way. Um, but it's a it's an all malt uh, beer that uh, is an old recipe from Cosmos, and so it's named in his honor. So like an amber kind of yeah Vienna lager kind of taste yeah yeah, yeah. yeah much like that yeah. 
Do you guys talk a lot about old German styles uh, when you talk about the brewery? We do. Uh, we've, we've departed recently and, and started making our first ales. Um, in fact, I brought a little bit of sample uh, pale ale, but the, that was the first in, in 100 years that that wasn't truly German or Czech influence. So we like to think of it as a sort of fusion, which is the, the fashionable uh, food word now. But um, so we make some, um, we make a Czech Pilsner, for instance, that I think is very authentic to the style. And in fact, uh, uh, the, the Czech, the 101, the Czech Pilsner uh, won some awards at the European Beer Star Award competing against Czech breweries. And so I think it's very authentic to the style. Uh, even even when we get a little more exotic, we have a holiday beer called Holiday Cheer, which is a uh, uh, a dark a, a dunkel, and it's flavored with Texas peaches and pecans. So it's it's got some German roots and a little bit of Texas flair as well. And so, and the Bach the same way. There's some German roots to it. It's not a true Bach. It's really an, it's a great example of an American dark lager. And when it wins awards, which it does, it wins in that category. Uh, but it does have you know there, there's a little bit of you can hear a little German spoken in almost every beer that we make, or a little Czech. Let's try the Shiner Bach. This is my first time having Shiner ever. Ever. You know, um, there's not one in this box. I think it's <laughs> still over in the, in the... We'll have it after. The what's cooler. the next one? The Wild Honey? What's that? That's a Wild Hair, and it's an American pale ale. The first uh, We expanded the brewery two years ago um, to create an ale house, and so this is the first ale that we produced. We know what I'm Everything chewing on. Everything has been lager. I'm chewing on uh, Zygmunt's pretzels. The They're new, really good. These sourdough are good, Lena. Thank you. They're like bread. It's <laughs> yeah. It's, I'm I'm hoping we're gonna move more into bread with I this. I think it's one. my favorite pretzel you ever made. I my favorite is the just the, it's just plain because we, we also do a lot of flavored yeah. ones and I brought some truffle cheddar. And you're really tough. You know, she's a tough cookie. I mean, you're so successful because you're really you're really demanding and and you don't really you don't like things that aren't up to your standards, do you? Well, we try. We are, you know, a specialty, so we have to, I guess, do the best we can. All we make is pretzels, so it's, uh, yeah, it has to be strong <laughs> every time. Yeah. And you were also influenced by, uh, like, Austrian, German. Well, because, like, we, America was street, you get street pretzels that are kind of dried out. They don't really have much flavor. When, yeah, I had one yesterday, yeah. Oh, you did? <laughs> perfect. Yeah, you described it well. Well, I think they were all perfect at the beginning. They were all homemade, and the only way to make them is the German way, which is dipping them in, by dipping them in lye and sodium hydroxide. And that really what makes them German. That's the crust, oh. that the, that's the color, that the flavor of the pretzel. And then as, as it uh, left the homes and went into mass production, um, yeah, I think they switched to just boiling in um, baking soda which is safer, I guess, overall, um, and faster and cheaper and so on. So it's disappeared. Yeah. Well, a lot of our listeners do. I'm, I'm got, i got pretzel in my mouth. Yeah. I'm not stopped eating. <laughs> a lot of our listeners are home brewers. Uh, you know, when you, when you make a pretzel, what, what is the step about dipping in lye, and, and how dangerous is it? It's really not dangerous uh, if you handle the solution properly, which means that don't rub your ha- you know, eyes with your hands while it's still wet. Um, neutralize with acid, any vinegar solution will be fine. It, gloves, it's, that's not, not much scarier than any cleaning um, <laughs> um, chemicals. Yeah, but what lye does, it just um, cooks the surface and um, gives this sheen and very characteristic flavor. And then whatever um, poisonous... Uh, in the lye, <laughs> um, it just all disappears in the heat. So oh, it's completely yeah. neutralized by the heat. Yeah, but I think a lot of it was also... Um, so whatever doesn't kill you is good for you, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, well, my, my kids grew up eating it. It's totally safe. I'm not sure I'd use that word poisonous. But <laughs> <laughs> and what did you just pour for me, Eric? This is, is that a ginger beer? That is um, our summer seasonal, which is called Ruby Redbird. Uh, the ruby name comes from uh, ruby red grapefruit, which is born in, uh, or uh, uh, raised in the Texas Rio Grande Valley. And then it's got a hint of ginger there also. Redbird, it's called Redbird. Almost everybody who works at the brewery has a nickname. Redbird is a woman who's worked at the brewery for many years, mm-hmm. and this beer was named in her honor. But it's another example of how we have sort of a, the mainstay line of, of Shiner Bach and uh, Shiner Premium, which is a, a golden lager. It's the original recipe. And then the brewery, I think, has been very good about trying to stretch and experiment a little bit. And so the, the Ruby Redbird 
uh, as a fruit infused beer. That's not, you know, they're not doing that a lot in Cosmo Spetzel's day, but um, it turned out to be uh, our most popular seasonal. It's very, uh, very, very popular during the summer. We do the the holiday cheer, which has uh, Fredericksburg peaches and pecans in it. Uh, Jimmy Mork, the brewmaster, actually roasts the pecans himself out in front of the brewery, and so uh, uh, it's it's all really uh, like I said, kind of a small town operation it's still. Everything we do, um, but yeah, we're trying to stretch. So we've created uh, the pale ale, a farmhouse ale, which is uh, FM nine sixty six, which commemorates the road that goes in front of the brewery, and so there's that. Not, I don't know if experimental is the right word, but but we are trying to stretch and expand and, and have a, a craftier side to us as well as, as the, the mainstay beers. So. Well, I, we're going to do an event this weekend, New mm-hmm. York City Hot Sauce Expo, and we just got on the, on the phone. We're going to have some Shiner there. I'm not sure what, Excellent. but we're going to have some Shiner in, uh, in kegs. And, uh, Lena, right now we're going to take a short break. We're going to taste some pretzels and hot sauces. We'll be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. All right, let's taste a couple of hot sauces. This is yeah. this is. You're listening to Home of Emptiness by Pamela Royal on the Heritage Radio Network dot org. Hey, welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. Thanks to our sponsor, GreatBrewers.com. Learn more about beer and uh, where to find it on the Beer Cloud. Go to GreatBrewers.com. Thanks for that uh, little piece, Joe. It was, it was kind of like a Texas twang song in the background. I think we're going down south. we got uh, Shiner here, uh, Eric Weber. He's the PR guy from Shiner, just coming into New York. we get some pretzels here from Sigmund's Pretzels, and uh, we're trying some hot sauces. The New York City Hot Sauce Expo is this weekend and two weeks ago. At Jimmy's number 43, we judged uh, over 100 hot sauces from around the world. And some of those that we tasted, uh, we're, we're tasting right now with pretzels and uh, some margarita pizza from Roberta's. So there's some pretty hot stuff. I mean, I, I thought with a, a theme like Shiner in Texas, it would be good to have pretzels and, and uh, hot sauce. Um, there, we had such a, a variety of hot sauce, unbelievable. Many are from New York. Wow. Our good buddy, uh, New York City Hot Sauce uh, Company, uh, John Bratton, he makes... Uh, some uses peppers from the Brooklyn Rooftop Gardens at Brooklyn Grange. There's uh, Steve Seabury with High River Sauces. There's Heartbreaking Dawn. There's a lot of really good ones from this area who are award-winning, but um, you'll see uh, over 40 of them this weekend. And uh, what do you guys think about the hot sauce? Do, do, do you think about hot sauce in Texas? I know you guys do a lot of barbecue. I know you're in New York at Hill Country Barbecue, and they're one of the reasons why you guys came to New York, right? Hill Country had been um, asking for, for beer since they opened. Asking maybe too too mild a term, uh, they put in uh, draft lines uh, when they opened the restaurant six years ago and never used them until this last week, until Friday when they tapped the first kegs of Shiner. They okay. set them aside for Shiner and then they started asking for it and asking for it. And I think that it was a maybe daily thing, at least weekly thing, where they would call somebody at the brewery and ask. And so finally they got it this weekend. So um, we have an affinity for barbecue. That's a, a sort of Texas thing, but think also the beers tend to uh, – all beer, I think, goes well with barbecue or just about all beer. Um, and so I think that's a mix. And, yeah, hot sauce t- – typically we're thinking in terms of Texas of more of the uh, salsa-style hot sauce, and people are uh, as opinionated there as they are about their beer or their barbecue. 
but yeah, it's we talk a lot about it, and of course Texans will tell you nobody eats hotter or whatever. But this one, the Tabanero, is really good. What's the label on that? Uh, Tabanero. Tabanero. Yeah. Yeah, people send in hot sauce from all, even as far as Germany and Oregon. I don't know, but I could eat that a lot. So, <laughs> yeah, it's good on the pizza here it's too. Perfect. Yeah. Hey, we got our, a call in guest um, talking about food and beer pairings. Uh, his name is Mark Strubrunt. He's known as the Belgian Beer Cafe. He tours. He's a beer sommelier. He he tours and does special events around the world with Belgian breweries like Leffa and Stella. Um, Mark, how are you? Welcome to the show. Hi there. I'm very jealous hearing about pretzel and hot sauce and pizza and barbecue. <laughs> well, with your expertise, you know, what, what kind of beers would go well with a barbecue and hot sauce? Is that something that Belgian um, beers Well, get into? as we said before, lots of beers go very well with, um, with barbecue and hot sauce. But surprisingly, um, I was uh, thinking about some good Belgian fruit beers that would go mm. very well with it. You mean like Lambics and things like that? Lambics or uh, white beer based ones or, or even a Flemish brand cherry beer oh, would nice. be very good sort of uh, can counterbalance our heat with some sweetness and some tartness. Hmm. So tell us about your background because you're you're kind of a, a very serious beer guy. You're you're a knowledge expert. Um, you're a, a a master beer sommelier. How did you get started in the in the beer world? Um, like uh, all of us, by accident, um, sort of started my career in, in law school in Belgium. And to fund my studies, I started working in a specialist beer bar in Belgium. And after one year, I thought beer was more interesting than law, so I switched over and came to the good side. And then, um, then qualified as a as a sommelier, as a beer sommelier. So and now I've got a fantastic job to travel around the world, as you were saying. Um, and also, I'm coming to New York to uh, the Belgian Beer Cafe Nomad to train up everybody and introduce everybody on the great Belgian beers we're going to have on offer and also do a lot of uh, food there. So that actually, that's going to be an, an, an uh, establishment in the Nomad Hotel called the Belgian Beer it's, Cafe? Uh, yes. It's going to be Fifth Avenue and uh, 26th. Um, so the Belgian Beer Cafe uh, bringing you the Belgian hospitality, great Belgian food, and um, a great range of Belgian beers. We're going to have more than 50 Belgian beers, sort of ranging from the classics, um, the well-known brands, going from the classic uh, Belgian Lager Cellar all the way down to the, the Lambic beers, the, the Southern beers, you name it, all Belgian beer stocks will be uh, represented there. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Um, I, I, do you, I know there's some issues that come up for you, like uh, you care about serving beer at proper temperature. Oh, absolutely. Um, and what we're going to do is because we, we, we want to really bring Belgium uh, to New York, so I'm really honored to come to one of the great beer capitals in the world. Um, but we're going to do Belgian style. That means we're going to serve all the beers in the correct large way over the correct foreign uh, ritual. Um, and also what we're going to do is, if, when you go to Belgium, every Belgian bottled beer is offered at three temperatures, which will be fridge, room temperature, which will be a stock back bar, but also we'll have the cellar temperature. So you can decide what temperature you, you want oh, to so be it's not, it's not like that. you're determining that each beer has a perfect temperature. You're letting people choose. Um, well, we will do recommendations, but we believe that and it's also the, the, the whole thing with Belgian beers is that you drink them as you want them. And as you know, uh, temperatures have an impact on, on the aroma and the flavor of the beer. So, But the, the tradition in Belgium is to, to let people have that choice. And people in Belgium are very particular about it. They will say, can I my beer from, uh, from the cellar? Can I have it at room temperature? So, um, and that's why we want to represent this. It's really to the Belgian thing with the Belgian beer cafe. I don't know if you agree with this, Mark, but it seems like we're hearing more about proper glassware now, which is something I think for a long time that Americans didn't really think about. Uh, pint glasses in America were usually not a pint glass, but a bar glass, a mixing glass. But uh, do you see that as... Yeah. Uh, uh, sort of a growing trend for for American beer fans? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think more and more, and I think people more and more are, are getting sort of aware, and lots of breweries, cloud breweries, and, and, and other breweries as well, sort of realizing that um, the, glass, the proper glassware has a big impact on the aroma, the, the, the taste of the beer, and also affects the carbonation. But overall, it's all about that flavor experience, getting that proper and, and correct uh, flavor experience. So a lot of people think there's a bit of a gimmick behind it, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of work behind it, and it's an easy thing for all the listeners. They can try it out. Just pour um, anywhere you want, put in a straight glass and put in a wine glass, and just smell the difference, and you'll immediately 
um, why, the importance of using the curriculum as well. Well, Mark, now how did you go from being a, a law student and working in a bar to being this Mr. Belgian beer, beer cafe guy? Like, tell us a couple steps along the way where you where you learn or, or you grew or some great experiences you had uh, working in Belgium. Um, well, I started working in a, in a uh, specialty beer bar, which is in a way uh, what the Belgian Beer Cafe also is about. It's a place where you go to try different beers, and these are bars which will have 100, 200, up to 2,000 different beers. So I worked in various of these different bars and then started working very closely with different brewers um, and then started doing very uh, different courses and also then started studying. Um, after which I then moved to uh, London, England, uh, to start working for a Belgian restaurant chain and helping to develop uh, the concept. And more and more, I thought there was a, a gap there to, to educate people, inform people, but in a way that uh, without being too technical, sort of provide more sort of a, uh, an education really for people. And then I had a great opportunity to start traveling around the world. So I now travel from China all the way to the States, uh, North and South. Um, going to various events uh, to demonstrate uh, uh, how to beer, uh, taste beer, how to pour beer, also do a lot of food pairing. There's a great things you can do, and you guys were already talking about um, matching beer with food. So, um, so yeah, I think I've got one of the best shops in the world. I think you did too, man. And we're, we're struggling with the hot sauce. I just had... Um, Eric, what was it? What's that wide mouth one that we just had in front of you, Lena? This, uh, this sauce guy, or sauce? sauce? Yeah. Sauce, hot sauce. Yeah. Mm. I had a, a quick, you mentioned um, chi- you mentioned China, and I was curious about that because, of course, like with every other commodity, China is an enormous, enormous market. And I, I know that there are large beer consumers probably just by volume of people, but I don't know anything about that beer scene yeah. there. Um uh, is it uh, at all a sophisticated beer market, or is it uh, an emerging beer market? It's very emerging, but it's it's, it's uh, they're catching up very quickly, um, and they're really becoming uh, very knowledgeable, and they really want to know everything about beer. So they're really entering this whole new world. So it's fascinating to to to, to see these differences between uh, the different countries. Um, and they then it's a big discovery for them all these different types of beer. Uh, so, which in a way I see in the states as well, um, which is great to see all the craft beers, and it makes me enormously proud to sort of see that uh, a lot of craft beers around the world, and especially in the states, and sort of see that our Belgian beers have been the inspiration um, to different styles within the craft beer. So, um, I think we've we've got interesting and fascinating times ahead. Mark, I'm gonna I want to put you on the spot uh, before we close out this segment. Okay, tell us three of your favorite uh, Belgian beer and food classic pairing combinations. Um, obviously, Belgium is known for its beers and its chocolate, so I have to talk about Belgian chocolate. Um, so uh, a great um, like a Leffert Dark uh, or a, um, West Mold Double Trappist beers uh, combined with uh, Belgian chocolate or Belgian chocolate desserts. It's just a die for fantastic combination. Um, another one as well is the, the, the wheat beer, the Belgian wheat beers, uh, like the Hoog Garden. Uh, for those people who like hummus, try it out. It's absolutely oh, fantastic. Oh, wow, wheat, wheat beer and hummus, that's text. interesting. Text. Sorry? Oh, that sounds interesting. interesting wheat yeah. beer and hummus, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but uh, also, uh, if you try, for instance, the the, uh, the East Flemish uh, old brands, uh, the Leafmans, or even the Rodenbacks, if you uh, try those things with uh, goat cheese, um, sort of um, do those uh, similar flavors, sort of the tangy tart flavors uh, working together, the, those are fantastic as well. Um, but I think my all-time favorite must be um, a Leffe Blonde and a Creme Brulee. <laughs> that sounds good. I'm getting hungry. Well, I'll tell you, thanks so much, Mark, for coming on the air. And uh, you can stay on listening. We can talk later, too. But uh, we eat, drink eating. I guess you eat, eat hot eating sauce or you drink it. I don't know. Do you drink hot know. sauce? I just had a little bit of that sauce, and my mouth is still burning. I, the one thing I think some people say you'd have to have milk afterwards. I don't think beer or milk really dulls the, the heat, but I think chocolate does. I think I could use some the chocolate fats. right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, any fat will take care of it, uh, right? That's why I think they recommend the good hot milk. sauce ought to ought to be like a stalker where you <laughs> don't really notice it at first, and by the time it hits you, it's it's too late. <laughs> it's, it's we just tried the black lager. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, Outstanding. That's good. 
All right. Well, Mark, thanks for calling in. We're going to take another short break. We're back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. You're listening to This Body by Pamela Royal on the Heritage Radio Network. Org. Heritage Radio Network.org is a member supported nonprofit organization. If you like what you're listening to, go to our website and click that donate button. Become a member and get special discounts, invites, VIP treatment, t shirts, and more. Support us in our mission to bring you the freshest food content in the nation. Hey, welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. Yep, uh, go out and, and become a member of the Heritage Radio Network. I'm a member. I think I'm member 501, which I think means I was the first member. Um, <laughs> Lena, are you a member of Heritage Radio Network? Yes, I am. You are, because you're good. And uh, Eric, one day. Not yet. You one too. day soon, I think. Maybe Shiner yeah. will become a, like a, a company member. If that's an option, I think we can talk about that. I think, I think sure. part of that involves giving T-shirts and providing beer at events. And, and necklaces. Things. I have okay. a necklace. All right. yeah. We've made the first step. There is a cool event coming up. I know that uh, the Heritage Radio Network is doing a, an event April 27th. It's called a Brut Says a Barbecue with Mark Ladner, who's a great chef from places like Del Posto, and he used to be at Lupa. I can say it like Lupa, Del Posto. but nope. um, <laughs> uh, That's going to be pretty cool. So I would check out the HeritageRadioNetwork.org site. And if you become a member, you can do all these great things. All right, so we're talking about hot sauce. New York City Hot Sauce Expo is this weekend. And we've got Shinerbach from Texas in New York. We've got Lena uh, Sigmund's Pretzels with a new pretzel. You do so many beer events. You came to the New York City Brewer's Choice. Uh, what other beer events are, are, are you at with your pretzels? I think any event that's happening is calling us. In this select capacity, as a vendor, a sponsor, and we love to go. And what what are go. some of the events that you like? I think the, what, what we do, what you guys do every um, fall, but this time it was in February, the City Winery. Yeah, the New York Bruce, City Brewers' I think choice, it's the best yeah. by far. Thank I you. think mostly because you really get to meet all the brewers. It's not just... I know, distributors, sales reps, sending their Well, you know, that's one thing. We have this group called the Good Beer Seal, and there's 41 beer bars in New York, and there's more, and there's going to be yeah. more, and some in Long Island and New Jersey. But there's places you can go and, and really try all the best beers in the world. And, you know, honestly, sometimes that's better than going to a beer fest because, you know, I know up the street from me there's a bar called Proletariat, and he only has really cool, interesting small breweries. Then you and, right? uh, yeah, just off, go to Jamie's number 43, the blog post today. I just went through my inventory today, and I was like, oh, my God, I've got all these interesting, unusual breweries up. That no one's ever heard of, yeah. and uh, I've got like five Green Flash on draft tonight. It's 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 just crazy. And New York has this great beer scene, and that's why it's great to welcome you guys too, because everyone's waiting for Shiner. Uh, we're we're so happy to be here. But this is I, it's a very exciting time just to to be a beer fan in the, in the U.S. I mean, pre prohibition, there were a lot more breweries than there are now, but there is more really good beer being made in the United States right now than ever before, and that just keeps growing. And so you're getting varieties that, that you never would have seen before. You're getting uh, uh, introduced to styles that uh, you know, before were so obscure that you could never find them. You'd only heard about them, and now they're being made down the street. And I think that's awesome. I mean, any town you go to, almost of any size, somebody's making beer. And probably someone's making really good beer. And I think that's, that's very exciting. Um, 
And so we're glad to be in New York because it's a really good beer town, for one thing. And that makes it tough for people like us because the competition's very stiff because there's good beer being made here. And people in this town know beer really well. But I, I, we're confident that we can stack up. I mean, Shiner has a place uh, in the sort of beer pantheon that I think is kind of nice. So you guys at Shiner, so you're considered a craft brewery. We're the, according to the Brewers Association, we're the fourth largest craft brewer in the country. Um, that actually includes uh, Shiner is, is owned by one person, but he also owns Bridgeport Brewery in Portland, and he owns uh, Trumer, in, uh, which is in Berkeley, California, Trumer Pills. Uh, but, yeah, it's considered a craft brewer. And uh, we're we're very proud of that. We're, I mean, we're we were canning our beer long before any craft brewer was doing that, and now it's that's quite a trend. And we like to think we were ahead of that. But one thing, a, a place that, that I think Shiner is very proud of, a, a beer like Shiner Bach, which is not a really extreme craft beer. It's not like some of the the, the very extreme uh, Belgian styles or IPA styles. But I think that one thing that that Sam Adams, that Shiner, that that New Belgium to a certain degree, and and Sierra Nevada don't get enough credit for is moving people from mass market beer to to the craft beer and I think so in some cases Shiner Bach was an intermediate step for a lot of people who were afraid of dark beer they tried it they liked it they either stay with it because they like it and they're lifelong fans or maybe they decide they they next want to try whatever a Schwartz beer or whatever else they want to try and so then they move on to other styles and um, and I think that's an important process in the whole sort of uh, of beer lovers um, uh, evolution, evolution is moving into that. The, the Nobody's, last, nobody starts with a an imperial stout, or you, know, you, you you move into that, and some you got to move. Well, now I'm going stuff. backwards. I'm, I'm going into really good session <laughs> beers. Like this is this is almost like a Schwarz beer. What's the last beer you poured for us? That is uh, Shiner's Bohemian Black Lager, and it is uh, it's our take on a Schwarz beer. It's of course it's uh, uh, dark uh, uh, roasted malts. Um, it was one of our anniversary beers. We did a series of beers leading up to the centennial of the brewery, which was uh, th- a little over three years ago, and it proved to be really popular. The anniversary beers were meant to be uh, not seasonal but short-term. They, they, they were just going to be out for a little while and then gone, uh, but a couple of them really caught on, and this was one of them. And it will be available here in New York. It's, it's become one of our best sellers. Uh, but yeah, dark coffee notes to it, and uh, it's delicious. yeah, it's uh, thank you. It's yeah. uh, it's it's my favorite. So. Hey, talking about the craft beer scene, our, our, our next call-in guest, it's uh, Jared Stutz. He's coming up, trying to raise money for his documentary film Brewers by the Bay. Jared, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. How's it going? So I checked that you've got a really great little video. You're on the Indiegogo platform. Let let everyone know uh, how they can learn more about your film, and 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 you're raising money to make the film, right? I am. I am, definitely. Yeah, they can actually just go to com, and that will redirect them to the Indiegogo website. So. Great. So what, what, why did you... Uh, are you a filmmaker to begin with? Is that your background? Uh, this is actually my first film, believe it or not. So, uh, so but yeah, hopefully I'll be uh, continuing to make documentaries, and this is just my first one right now. So, so uh, it's, it's, I saw that uh, your spokesperson, it's Brendan. He's the brewer from Thirsty Beer. Uh, yep, brewery. I'm here right here. All right. How are you, Brendan? I'm doing great. How are you doing? You did great, man. It was it's a great video. Uh maybe want to give maybe I'll put fifty dollars in. I don't know if <laughs> we'll take it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think if you go to our website, goodbeersteel.com, we're gonna post that video so people can check that out. Cool. Um tell you guys gotta talk. So tell us tell us about the video project, what why you're doing it, and some of the, the top brewers in in the San Francisco area that are gonna be in your film. Sure. Um, yeah, so the uh, the project is really about the, the history of beer in San Francisco. Really, all I mean, it's dating all the way back to 1847. It's pretty incredible that, you know, when you think about beer being made back then, I mean, a lot of people think about loggers and, you know, well, San Francisco actually claimed to have porters and ales, and uh, they actually had a few different styles. And then um, then shortly after, I mean, just a few different things happened. The earthquake happened. A lot of breweries were actually destroyed. And then after that, there's prohibition. And then after prohibition, a lot of a lot of breweries came back, and they're making lager beers. And uh, Brendan, if you want to take over from there, I know you like to talk about the other bar house. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean the history of uh, beer in San Francisco is pretty extensive. We're going to do our best uh, job in putting it in a, into an hour and a half format. But um, so yeah, basically after prohibition and World War II, uh, I'm sure there was an industrialization of 
well, beer across not only San Francisco, but also across the nation. And I think uh, one of the key elements here for this specific documentary is the fact that a gentleman named Fritz Maytag opened or reopened uh, a place called Anchor, Anchor Brewing Company and kept the steam beer alive, for example, which is sort of America's indigenous beer in a way. And that small production of a unique beverage or unique beer led to, uh, at least in my mind, sort of the renaissance in beer in America, because it, they did start, they brewed the first porter for a long time, the first barley wine. Um, Liberty Ale is widely considered to be the first IPA. So a lot of firsts came out of that brewery, and that's led to, and this is like, uh, well, the beginning of the 80s when we started having other breweries pop up in the area, at least in the Bay Area, which would be a New Albion Brewing Company being a, you know, the prime example. So... I mean, long story short, there's a lot to talk about here in terms of the history of beer in San Francisco, and so we're trying to no, capture as good, much man. as we can. We're, we're gonna we're gonna get you guys again. Say how they can find you the website again. Sure, yeah, they yeah. can go to Brewers by the Bay. That's, that's, um, we don't have all the time to talk to you guys, but I want to say uh, so, Brendan. Yeah. Uh, tell me uh, five small breweries in the San Francisco area that you like. <laughs> in the San Francisco area, besides my own, um, well. We've got a lot of good ones here. I'm a big fan of, in terms of pubs, we've got great ones like uh, Magnolia, which is uh, makes English-style ales, and 21A is around the corner from us here. Um, on the larger scale, which is the production side, obviously we have Anchor, but we also have Speakeasy, which makes a lot of great uh, great ales and lagers. Uh, big fan of Lagunitas. Um, how many more do you need? I can go on and on, and unfortunately. But tell us the name of your brewery again. Area. What's the name of your brewery? Uh, I work at Thirsty Bear Brewing Company in downtown San Francisco. How, right. many, how many people are making beer in the Bay Area now, commercially? Oh, uh, i got to tie that up. Um, 30, maybe? Wow. Wow. That's awesome. I'll throw that out there. I mean, we've got, working our way down the peninsula, there's a lot of breweries popping up down there, all the way down to San Jose, which would be a large one at Gordon Bish, and then you go hop around the corner, it goes to Buffalo Bills, which is one of the original uh, breweries here in America. And there's, uh, I, there's at least 10 in, in the making right now. I know uh, awesome. Faction's going to come in on. Cellar Maker is going to come on down in San Francisco, down the street. Um, you can, you can and there's the that. bigger ones like Pyramid, Schrumer, Pilsner. Um, it goes on. I'm making, it, I haven't actually uh, counted them all, to be saying, honest with you. But uh, well, Brennan, we that's wait. Hold on a second. Specifically uh, focusing on the city and county of San Francisco. Awesome. Hold on one so second. We so, won't be so, talking uh, about Marin County the East Bay or the South Bay, for example. Great. Guys, hold on for one second. So um, th- thanks for coming on. We're, we're going to steer people to you guys. Uh, we, had, we had a guy last month. He was in Long Island. He was trying to raise money to get a hop harvester for his hop farm. I think he raised like thirty grand. And uh, we'll make sure that people check you out. Check out Brewers by the Bay. Uh, they're doing Indiegogo. They're trying to raise $10,000 to get yep. their, uh, their film made about San Francisco breweries. Thanks for coming on, guys. Right. We're, we're going to keep talking, but the sound's not so good, okay? Thank okay. you. Thank you. So, Eric, so what, he mentioned the other brewery that you guys own. What, what is it? Trumer. Trumer. Uh, brewer I Trumer. And uh, there's a Trumer brewery in, uh, in Austria, which has been brewing for about 400 years. And I think there was some talk about maybe uh, importing that. And the, the people at the brewery there said, no, it wouldn't be the same. And so uh, Carlos Alvarez, who owns Shiner and owns Bridgeport, uh, found a place where the water and they, they pretty much recreated the brewery from Salzburg in Berkeley. And so what they feel is they believe that they're brewing exactly the same Trumer pills that you would get in Austria, but they're brewing it in Berkeley. And it's uh, uh, extreme, it doesn't have wide distribution yet, extremely popular in California, moving into Texas and some other states. Don't know exactly the distribution there, but uh, uh, it's, a, yeah, it's a great classic uh, sort of German. So style how pills. long has, has uh, Carlos been the owner of Shiner and Trumer? He, and he, bought, it, uh, he bought Shiner in, the, uh, in 1989. Uh, prior to that, his experience in the beer business, uh, he's originally from Mexico and worked for Modelo. And he was the original uh, distributor for Corona in the United States. And uh, eventually Corona uh, reached, uh, they swung a deal with one of the big houses. And so that left him um, without his flagship but with the resources to, to uh, do other things. And he likes the... Uh, Sort of small aspect of brewing, and so he bought the the the, uh, 
Shiner Brewery, uh, which was struggling at the time. And so he really he saved the brewery, which uh, thankfully he did. And then he eventually brought Bridgeport. And Bre- uh, Trumer is much newer. Trumer is only, I think, four or five years old. Wow. Well, that's a, that's a good backstory. It, it, it's nice to have you on. Um, you know, like I said, so many people from Texas have talked about China. It's my first time trying it. <laughs> and it's exciting to try it on the air. And we're going to see you this weekend at New York City uh, Hot Sauce Expo, which is kind of cool. It is. Uh, I'm not like, the most excitable person, but it's, uh, it's hard to, to underscore how excited Texans are. Uh, we had a few, uh, the president of the local Texas X's Club, which is the University of Texas Alumni Club in, in New York, who showed up at our distributor meeting the other night because they're just, they are so, they're just chomping at the bit really to, uh, to have Shiner here. And we're going to be a sponsor of their big chili cook off. And, um, yeah, on social media, we have just been inundated for, for the last few years with requests from, from Texans in New York. Uh, so it's a baked-in audience, but, of course, we're looking for a much broader audience than that. We're hoping that those people will share it with their friends and that your listeners and that other people will, will get out and give us a try and judge for themselves, and I think they'll like what they taste. All right. And, Alina, anything else you want to say? I really like your new – this is the experimental sourdough pretzel. It's a keeper. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks, thanks for letting for us try it on air, too. And I yeah. really like the red bird rubby and the black lager. Yes, thank you. You Excellent. should uh, – yes. Excellent. And you should drink – Three, four a day. <laughs> just, that's just for the health benefits. Well, we, let's make a toast to, to shine our, the right. black the black pills and uh, Lena's pretzels Thank from Sigma Pretzel. 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 All right. Welcome to New York. Thank yeah. you. And we'll give a little shout out here again. Thanks to our, our sponsor, GreatBrewers.com, a comprehensive website aimed at bringing the beer community together. All right, and we're going to give a shout out to Savor, which is the big uh, Brewers Association event this year. It's coming to New York City on June fourteenth and June fifteenth. It's the premier beer and food pairing event uh, in the nation. And uh, beginning Tuesday, April 16th, which is this week, a limited supply of Savar pre-sale tickets will be available to American Home Brewers Association and Brewers Association members. So go check out SavarCraftBeer.com. And, you know, I was just in uh, D.C. for the Craft Brewers Conference. So they, re- they really have it going on. You know, they've got uh, some of the, the, be- the best brewers in America. Um, and that weekend, actually, we're going to do uh, with a bunch of Long Island breweries. We're going to do some things in the city at Jimmy's Number 43 and uh, some good Brazil bars. So that's a good weekend to come to New York. If you're not here, you can come check out Shiner. Uh, we'll have it. So, again, thanks to our sponsors, greatbrewers.com, and you can find us on Facebook page and, again, our Twitter, at beer underscore sessions. Whoever retweets our tweets sometimes tonight is going to get a free Shiner T-shirt from us. All right. Thanks to Eric, Rich, Lena, Mark, and Jared for joining me here on the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Jimmy Thank Carboni. You. Thanks to our producers, Jack Ensley, Brie O'Connor, and our engineer, Joe Galarraga. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Beer Sessions Radio. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like, it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.